So hi there, we are at GoTo Conference Monday morning and um, we have this group here, Martin, Todd, Victor and me, Creston. We are giving a talk, long talk this afternoon about reactive, uh, what is reactive, what is a reactive application, uh, what is a reactive architecture. So we thought we'd just do a quick rundown on the content of this uh, and why reactive is important. So I'll pass the word to Martin. Oh, thanks, okay. Kristen. So reactive is quite interesting because things have changed of late. We are starting to find applications now that whenever we see them, they become business critical. So this is different from what was happening on the web, say, 10, 15, 20 years ago. Now, the, the Internet channel is the only channel in many cases for businesses to connect. Plus, we combine that with technology has been fundamentally changing as we've been going massive multi-core, going to cloud, going to lots of computers. This is different from the single big computer that we used to have. And the confluence of those two things has changed what we do. So for the business critical side, things need to be up 24-7. We need to do hot upgrades, like highly resilient, highly responsive. We can grow and shrink these in our environments. And what we're seeing is there's a standard type of application that's appearing. It can be in many languages and many technologies, but it's got a similar set of characteristics. A lot of this is not new. Some of the techniques have been around a long time, but they're becoming mainstream. I think that's what's really standing out at this point. We've been looking at these sorts of applications. We're all finding them. We've all got very different backgrounds, but we're all starting to see this confluence starting to come together. And we've named these properties that we're seeing as standard. So one is things are responsive, is if they don't respond in a timely manner, they're not very useful to the end user. They're effectively unavailable and users don't get the benefits they need. They also need to be very resilient because if it's not there, you can't offer that service. And people are expecting that now. We also have all of these interesting data centers with lots and lots of servers. So things need to grow and shrink because we want to have the right economies, the economies of scale. Some days we need to run on two or three computers. Some days we need to run on a thousand. Can our applications do that? Well, what's interesting underneath a lot of that is they're all fundamentally message driven. We've gone to a world where most things are synchronous, but synchronous designs restrict achieving some of these properties. And we're all looking at this from interesting ways. My experience happens to be with a lot of performance and making things responsive. So I'm looking at what algorithms make things responsive, what design patterns make things responsive. And so we need to like amortize expensive costs, batch in the right sort of way. Be aware of things like queuing theory, be aware of how you make things parallel, but avoid contention, making sure things are coherent. It's all very interesting. It's kind of fun and passionate to get back to proper computer science. Let's kind of be geeks rather than just the hipsters that are going on and offer this kind of great service that we've got out there. And that's kind of, that's where I'm driven from. Like some of these other guys are doing cool stuff like Crest. Yeah, I'm, I'm really engaged in, in, in patterns, the, all these patterns that contribute to uh, systems being resilient. So, so systems are, as Martin mentioned before, we can increasingly need these systems that are up 24-7. Um, and there be, systems are being more and more business critical. That's both in terms of money, uh, revenue stops when the system stops, or in terms of these various government infrastructures or public services, um, where there's a lot of IT systems that just need to be up all, the, all around the clock. So the stuff, for instance, um, that the doctors will use, the emergency ward will use um, when you call in now. So, um, Actually, that's the background why I uh, got engaged in this and started doing a lot of Erlang. And Erlang is, in many ways, uh, a big um, inspiration to, to the things that come out of this. Uh, they've been doing this uh, at Ericsson. They have been programming uh, phone switches that you obviously want to uh, have very high uptime on, on and you want to make it fault tolerant. So resilience, the concept of resilience, um, is really um, uh, describing a quality of something that can weather a storm. You know, after being bent, it'll bend back into shape. It'll deal with bad things that happen. And when you look at uh, the mix uh, of multi-core, multi-computers, cloud, distributed systems in many ways, there's so many things that can go wrong, and they will go wrong. And the hardware will break, 
uh, systems will get overloaded in various ways in terms of resources, I.O., network, disk, blah, blah, blah. But also, as systems grow, they have more human errors built into the software. We, I mean, I don't think there's anyone who believes that we can do these large distributed systems uh, with no errors in the code. So we have all these causes of fault, and we need to have some patterns that we can build, we can use to structure the handling of these uh, faults in the system. And that's, um, I think, a very interesting angle, and er Erlang can teach us a lot on that. A lot on that. Of course, there's, it's mostly about having, you know, se several systems that can observe each other, um, that can keep track. It is about making the errors um, first class, so you can reason about them in various ways. It's about isolating errors. So you have these isolated things that if one tumbles over, it doesn't mean that everything comes down as a set of domino breaks or something like that. You want to isolate the errors in various ways. So there's lots of interesting patterns in that. So there's the elastic thing. Maybe you'll, you'll kind of... Yeah, absolutely. Into that, yeah? It's, uh, it ties into that. So what's interesting is that the same, it's sort of the same things that give you the property of resilience can also give you the, the property of being elastic because being resilient is about isolation and, and elasticity is also about decoupling. So once you are decoupled, you can, it doesn't really matter which machine it runs on, right? So what we've seen is that not only do we not get faster CPUs, but we get more of them. So we see that we get more CPUs, not only on a single machine, but we're getting more machines. So if we want to take advantage of that, then we need to be sure that we can structure our applications and systems so that we can do that. So the first thing is to go asynchronous. We need to decouple the sender from the receiver, so to say. And being able to do that means that we can now take advantage of these other um, computers and more resources. But it's not only about the more resources, it's about the right resources. So when we know how much resources we need in our system at a given point in time, we can try to resize the, the resources that we're using. And that's very powerful. Uh, not only being able to react to increased load, but also being able to know what the load is going to be in the sense that payday is going to be one of those days where we just need 10 times the number of machines. So let's just bake that in and take advantage of that. So elasticity builds on the notion of scalability. So you need the scalability in order to get the elasticity part. But the thing that ties them together is being able to see how much of your resources is being used, like being able to keep metrics about your system. So that's, that's the elasticity part of things. But it really, sort of, to get the asynchronous part mm -hmm. of elasticity, you need to go message-driven. So, so let's, let's yeah, see about message-driven. Yeah. yeah, I mean, uh, the, the Internet kind of grew because we actually had a very decoupled system. Um, the, from, the, from the outset, something that wasn't centralized, something that wasn't synchronized, was necessary. Uh, and that actually fueled you know, the design of the Internet. So if we kind of apply that, we've seen it at various levels of granularity. We see it from uh, just communicating processes all the way down to actually the architectures of the chips that we have. They're all message passing based. And the reason is because uh, it actually follows very good patterns. It, it put, you know, puts bulkheads in for resiliency. It allows less to elasticity. You know, it, uh, it makes systems so that they can be asynchronous and, and more responsive. So as we, as we kind of look at you know, what are good patterns, you know, things that are message driven, things that have a, an asynchronous binary boundary, you know, are good things. You know, it's, not, it's not actually what it provides, it's actually what it takes away. It takes away the ability to tightly couple things together. And by basically forcing these things to be decoupled, you know, we get uh, the, the, the sort of having to think in those terms. And when we think in those terms, we develop systems which are, can handle elasticity better, can be more resilient, and can be more responsive. And actually, we do that, uh, and another side effect is, is that these systems are much more efficient most times um, because they just sort of follow certain patterns, just naturally. It's just the way they sort of, they, you know, kind of end up. Yeah, it's like many of these patterns are just not new. They've been around a long time, Chris, and you mentioned they're in our line. You go back to Tandem Nonstop, the work of Jim Graham, Pot Helen, like loads of wonderful work that goes back a long time. Mm -hmm. We just forgot yeah. this stuff, mm -hmm. but we're having to do it now. Yeah, it's been hidden in, in niche, various niches and uh, special, specialty areas, right? Yeah. That needed this, right? Yeah, so we need to do it. Like, all we're doing is like, we're talking about what these things are, we're trying to give it a name, and that's where Reactive is coming from, and the manifesto's backing that up and 
trying to make it visible, try to get it out there. Okay, cool. Yeah, thank you very much. Thank, thank you. you. Thank you. Thank you.